dear students i welcome you back to the lecture series on course material of transportation engineering 2 from the previous lecture we have started with the uh, next part of our syllabus within the transportation engineering 2 that is uh, airport engineering and the previous lecture we have also uh, seen the introduction of airport engineering that in terms of the development of airport in, uh, engineering and uh, its effect in India and the various agencies which have been there in the for controlling of the air navigation and then the classification of airports. In continuation of that in today's lecture we will be looking at different aircraft characteristics. In that sense the lecture has been outlined in the form like aircraft characteristics and the influence of aircraft characteristics. Those are the two specific aspects which we will be looking at. So, now we start with the uh, main thing that is the aircraft characteristics and uh, within these aircraft characteristics we will be looking at the various type of characteristics like uh, engine type and uh, propulsion, the size of uh, aircraft, the aircraft weight and the wheel configuration, the minimum turning radius, the minimum circling radius, a speed, capacity, noise vortices at tail ends, jet blast, fuel spillage. Uh, these are the various characteristics which needs to be uh, considered as far as uh, different design aspects of uh, the runways, terminals or uh, taxiways or aprons or uh, the maintenance units are concerned. And that is why if we have an idea of uh, that what is the characteristic is and how it is going to create an effect then we can design those facilities. So, therefore, in this, this same lecture we are going to discuss at the end about the different effects of these aircraft characteristics and those effects are basically related to the design features which ultimately have to be designed in any of the airport. Uh, those design features we will be considered, uh, we will be discussing in different lectures which are supposed to come after this one. So, we will be looking that uh, whatever we are uh, studying today or whatever we are trying to understand today has its implication in the coming uh, design aspects. So, uh, you may be a little careful so as to look at that what characteristic is going to create an effect at what level or for what particular design. So, in this case uh, in the aircraft characteristics we will be starting with the first type of a characteristic that is uh, engine type and propulsion. Uh, in this engine type of propulsion we have to look at uh, that uh, what are the various types of engines which are available which can be used so as to provide uh, the movement of the aircraft and then what type of movement of the aircraft can be provided that is uh, uh, how fast or how slow that can be provided or at what particular altitude that can be provided or uh, whether it is an atmospheric propulsion system or it is a trans atmospheric propulsion system that can be provided. Now, this propulsion may be uh, through any type of uh, engine, we, ha uh, we have a different type of engines uh, which can be used for providing the type of propulsion which we are interested in. Uh, what we see is that uh, there is a piston engine, there is a jet engine where within the jet engine again there are different type of the jets available. Uh, they are termed as a turbojet, they are termed as the turbo propulsion or the ramjet and then there is a rocket engine. So, uh, all these things, all these type of engines from the name, their name itself suggests uh, uh, they tries to define that how they can be used. The piston engine as uh, can be seen or as we have looked at uh, as far as the highways are concerned or as far as the railways are concerned that uh, these are the most conventional type of the engines which have been used where they are dependent on the movement of a piston and the, with the movement of the piston the amount of torque and power is being generated and that torque and power is utilized by the vehicle for its movement. So, uh, there is a more of a conventional type of engines which uses the fuel and then that fuel is utilized so as to convert it into uh, the mechanical or the electrical energy. 
Whereas, if you come to the jet engine sort of a condition, there is uh, uh, that these engines are having a capacity of providing a jet at the back with a high thrust and this high thrust is utilized for moving the vehicle in the forward direction. So, that is the concept with the jet engine types and within these jet engine types then uh, what type of jet is being provided whether that is a, a, a jet which is a known as a turbo jet or uh, there is a jet which is termed as a turbo propulsion where the uh, not the thrust only is there, but there is the sucking of a heavy amount of air and then with the help of the propulsion system and then uh, it is being transformed into the uh, jet from the back that is uh, the type of the situation where in the case of ramjet we are not using the components of the fuel so as to provide that propulsion system. And the uh, rocket engines you have already seen that they are generally trans atmospheric conditions that is we are leaving the atmosphere and moving into the space then at that point uh, we require the rocket engines. So, it depends on for what type of uh, movement we are interested in uh, we can provide the type of the engine. And as we look at this uh, set of uh, type of engines we move starting from the piston engine to the rocket engine then uh, uh, the amount of power which they are going to generate is higher in this series in this order at the same time the, uh, the speed which will be provided for the vehicle is also going to be uh, increasing in the same order. Now, when we look at these one then what we found is that, that these can be used so as to provide the speeds as, as high as 500 kilometers per hour mostly in the case of the piston engine categories. And uh, then in the case of jet engine categories it may be somewhere around 800 kilometers per hour in the case of turbo jet and uh, turbo propulsion systems and the ramjet condition may go to 1280 to 2400 kilometers per hour that is the speed with which the aircraft can move. And in the case of the rocket engine it may go to as high as 4600 kilometers per hour. So, that is how the speed may change with the provision of a type of an engine in an aircraft and that is uh, that is the type of the category of the aircrafts which we can look at. And these aircrafts uh, uh, may operate at uh, different altitudes, uh, it again depends on the type of the engine and the propulsive power available uh, to the engine as well as to the aircraft or the vehicle. Uh, they can be operated at the low altitudes or low to high altitudes or middle altitudes. Uh, generally, uh, when we look at the piston engines, then they can be operated at the low altitudes where these uh, uh, turbojet or turbo propulsions, they can vary uh, bit in somewhere between low to high altitudes ramjets are around in the middle altitudes. Uh, that is uh, the way uh, we are using them. And then this ramjet is also used in missiles and the rocket engines are used for outside atmospheric operations. Because uh, ramjet as uh, we see that it is as a higher speed and then uh, uh, it can uh, be utilized using the middle altitudes where uh, there are less chances of the other type of the operating systems being using with the air especially the aircrafts which will be either moving at the low or the high altitudes most of the time in new technology conditions they are the high altitude conditions then uh, uh, the middle altitude conditions can be used for the operation of the missiles and that is where the ramjets are being used. Then uh, uh, another thing is uh, the size of the aircraft then this size of the aircraft is uh, uh, one of the important things which is to be looked at. It is to be looked at in the sense that uh, there are three components which are going to create an effect in most of the cases of the vehicles that is uh, its length, uh, its height and its width. Now, here with the in the case of an aircraft it is uh, not a single main body of the vehicle which we are talking about. Uh, we have also to look at the wings which are coming out of the main body of the aircraft and that is where the overall wing span also becomes important and as we have seen in the guidelines being provided by ICAO 
or uh, by FAA that uh, it speaks of not of the size of the main body of the aircraft, but it talks about the wing span while classifying the airports. So, uh, that is the importance of uh, the wings of the aircraft and that is where the size of the aircraft at times has to be defined in terms of uh, the wing span. So, we have to look at uh, the what are the things uh, which are going to uh, define uh, overall size of the aircraft and this is defined using uh, certain basic parameters like uh, the fuselage length. Fuselage uh, uh, is the area which encompasses the uh, fuel which is to be transported along the aircraft which is used along the uh, path at the same time. It also encompasses the payload and that is uh, the passengers and the freight that will also be placed within the fuselage length and uh, that is the length which is provided from the nose of the aircraft to the tail of the aircraft. So, that is the overall length of the fuselage. Then another thing is the gear thread and this gear thread is uh, the distance between the main gears being provided. Then height, height is usually taken at the tail because uh, again in the case of the tail we provide a sort of a wing in the vertical direction and due to that wing which is provided in the vertical direction the height increases then the high topmost level of the fuselage provided at the nose. So, therefore, the height of the aircraft is taken at the tail. Then the width of the tail is to be uh, examined and is to be computed that what is the overall width of the tail because again in this case mm -hmm. apart from the main body at the tail that is the fuselage uh, whatever is the width of the fuselage at the tail there is uh, again the two small wings which are provided at the back and uh, that is why the overall width of the tail which encompasses the fuselage plus the wings has to be considered. Then there is a wheel base which is uh, the distance between the nose gear and the main gear because in the case of the aircrafts the wheels are provided at two lo uh, locations. One is uh, just below the nose where the pilots are sitting that is what we can understand uh, that is what is known as the nose. The pilots are sitting somewhere in the nose. And uh, just below that whatever gears are provided they are termed as nose gear, whereas uh, the main gears are located at the, uh, at the point where the wings are being connected with the main body that is fuseless. At that particular location at the bottom of the fuseless whatever wheels are provided and the way they are being connected that is the location of the main gear. So, the distance between this main gear location and the nose gear location defines the overall wheel base. And then the next uh, important parameter which defines the size of the aircraft is the wing span. And this wing span is calculated near the main gears where the two wings being provided on the side are getting connected with the fuselage that is the main body. And if we go along with these wings to the farthest point from one side to the farthest point on the other side, then this is what is the wing span. So, this is how the size of an aircraft is uh, defined using fuseless land threads, uh, gears and uh, height, tail width, uh, wing spans and the wheel base. Uh, this is uh, one diagram which tries to define uh, the same things as we have discussed just now. Here uh, we have the aircraft in the, the elevated condition on which we are looking from on it from the front side and uh, then we have this look uh, uh, diagram where it is in the plan and then this is from the side. So, this is how we are looking at this aircraft and what we see is that uh, uh, we are providing uh, uh, this particular aircraft with a nose gear that is uh, this is the nose of the aircraft. So, this is the nose of the aircraft and this is the location of the glasses of the cockpit where the pilots will be sitting. So, this is the location somewhere here where the pilots will be sitting. At this particular location just below this one, this is the fuselage body, this one, this body is the fuselage. So, this is nose and this is the tail. And then 
uh, at this location we are having the wings. So, these are the wings which are coming out like this on this side as well as there is the wing which is coming out on this side and that is how the symmetrical uh, design of the vehicle is being achieved. Now, the point is that where these wings are being connected with this fuselage body at that location whatever gears and the wheels are provided they are the main gears. And these main gears are provided at the connectivity of this wing with the fuselage and that is where uh, that is how they are provided at this location. This is for the nose one and these are for basically uh, the wing gear systems. Here they have been shown below the four propulsion systems or the engines being employed on this aircraft. Here this is a location of one engine, this is another location of the engine. Similarly, there are two engines on this wing. The engines are not provided in the case of the aircraft uh, within the main body, they are located on the wings. So, uh, whatever number of engines have to be provided, they should be pro uh, located uh, symmetrically and uh, in case there is only a single engine, then it has to be placed somewhere here, but generally it is not a single engine condition. We have the double engine condition and in that case on either of the wing, uh, one of the engines will be placed. Similarly, when it is a four engine condition then we have two engines on one wing and two engines on the other wing. If it is three, then there is uh, one engine to be provided uh, in the nose area condition. So, uh, that is how we try to achieve the symmetrical conditions of the engine, so that the thrust or the torque uh, or the power which is being generated by these engines is uh, distributed evenly through all of the body of the aircraft. Now, as we are talking here about the size of the aircraft, so what we see is that the distance between the one wheel being provided on this side with the connectivity of the wing on the right hand side with the fuseless and the distance between the another wheel which is provided on the connectivity of the wing on the left hand side with the fuseless is termed as gear thread. So, that is the gear thread distance because now if that it is taking a turn then this is how it is revolving with respect to this point. Then second thing is that uh, the wings are also provided at the tail. So, this is a smaller wing on this side and this side therefore, we have to look at the width of the tail also. So, this is how we take the distance from this to this point as the tail width. Then the length is from the nose to this end. So, that is what is the length being shown here. So, this is the nose and this is the tail. So, this is the overall length of the fuselage and this is the length of the aircraft. Similarly, the height is taken in terms of uh, a wing which is provided at the back on the tail and this looks like, like this in the case of the front diagram. So, this is at the back we are providing a, a, a tail in the vertical direction and uh, this defines the height. So, this is the height of the aircraft. So, these are the uh, things and along with this one then there is a wheel base as we have discussed the wheel base is the distance between the main gear which is located here and the nose gear which is located here. So, this distance being provided this is the wheel base that is with respect to this wheel the nose will be moving at a radius of this much. So, this will be taking a turn like this or taking a turn like this. So, this is why it is termed as wheel base. Now, we come to another important parameter of uh, an aircraft that is uh, aircraft weight and wheel configuration. Uh, what is the total amount of weight of an aircraft? That is uh, an important aspect. At the same time, how this load is going to be transferred to the pavement at the bottom is going to be defined by the wheel configuration and the number of wheels being provided. So, what number of wheels are provided and how they are provided is what is the wheel configuration. So, in the case of the aircraft weight, there are different type of weights which we can discuss. Uh, they are defined as the maximum gross takeoff weight, the maximum structural landing weight, the operating empty weight, the payload and zero fuel weight. So, these are the uh, five categories of the weights which can be there and here they have been designated as A, B, C and D. So, as to define uh, what is the correlational aspect between the diesel type of the weights which we will be looking at 
in a diagrammatic form. Uh, but what basically this maximum gross take of weight and others are, uh, in the case of this maximum gross take of weight, uh, this is the total amount of the weight which can be taken by an aircraft at the time when it is taking off from the landing from the runway strip to the air. So, at that point of a time whatever is the weight of an aircraft that weight is termed as takeoff weight. And obviously, at this point of a time whatever is the normal weight of an aircraft that is without any fuel, uh, without any passenger, without any freight, without any uh, crew, without any other materials being provided within this one that is simply the weight of the aircraft with its accessories is one weight plus then it is added to that with the weight of the fuel which is to be carried then to that it is added as a uh, the weight of the passengers or the freight. This weight of the passengers or the freight is termed as payload. Payload means it is a load which is being paid for and from where the revenues have been generated. So, that is the payload that it includes the passengers and it includes uh, uh, the freight. Then there is a zero fuel weight uh, that zero fuel weight is a condition when uh, uh, the aircraft is reaching the destination and the fuel is coming to the zero level. So, at that point of a time uh, whatever is the weight is there that is, uh, that is the zero fuel condition weight and then operating empty weight means uh, then uh, uh, we are operating without taking any other load that is the payload is not there that is what is the empty operating weight and we will look at uh, how they changes and there is another one is like uh, this maximum structural landing weight. Uh, as we have seen in the case of the takeoff weight where it incorporates all the type of the weights which can be there like the weight of the aircraft, weight of the payload, weight of the fuel, weight of the accessories being provided for the uh, passengers or for the freight. Uh, everything is included in this one whereas, uh, when we talk about the landing weight. Uh, as we can understand uh, when we are landing there will be passengers, there will be freight, there will be the weight of uh, the aircraft itself. But what is being uh, deducted from the takeoff weight is the weight of the fuel which is being consumed during the journey. So, whatever is the fuel which is being consumed during the journey that much amount of weight will get reduced and that will become the maximum structural landing weight. Now, the world maximum is coming depending on the size of the aircraft which will be using that airport. So, on the basis of that one whatever is the biggest aircraft which will be using the aircraft airport we will take the gross takeoff weight and the structural landing weight with respect to that aircraft. So, that is an important aspect because uh, uh, some of uh, the supporting system designs are dependent on these type of weights. Uh, here in this diagram we are trying to show the relationship of all these components uh, as uh, we have discussed that we have this A, B, C, D and E. If we look at C, D and E, C is operating empty weight, D is payload and E is zero fuel weight. So, here this uh, C is here, this is empty operating weight, this empty operating weight varies between 44 percent and 66 percent of the overall weight of uh, an aircraft. So, that is uh, we can understand that it comes up to this point. If we take if we assume this as a 100 percent scale then it will be up to this level. Then uh, uh, we have uh, this uh, D which is uh, the payload. So, this payload is uh, it varies uh, between 16 and 24 percent in a normal aircraft uh, where it is uh, we are talking about the passengers and we are talking about uh, the freight. Then uh, uh, we have this, this uh, zero uh, fuel weight and this zero fuel weight varies between 6 percent and 40 percent depending on the size of the aircraft and the distance for which uh, the aircraft is making a flight. So, that is what is the level and then there is also some reserve of a fuel which is which varies with a very small value of 4 to 6 percent. So, that is what is being shown here in terms of uh, 4 to 6 percent at this level. So, these are the different components of the weights which will be there. So, this is uh, 
with respect to the aircraft weight that is what we can understand is the main weight which is coming in within the aircraft uh, overall weight when it is taking off or landing is the weight of the aircraft itself. This is the amount of the weight of the aircraft itself. This is the fuel which is being consumed during the journey and this is reserve condition and these are the passengers etcetera. If they are being removed then it is an empty condition and the aircraft is moving with the empty condition. So, here what we are seeing is if we consider whole of this weight then it is total takeoff weight that is takeoff weight being shown by A. And if we remove the weight of the fuel which is consumed during the journey then what we are left with is B and this B is nothing but the structural landing weight with which the aircraft will be landing on any airport. So, these are the weight and the weight characteristics of the air craft and now we will look at uh, the wheel configurations. Uh, wheel configurations as uh, I have told is that uh, 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 what we found is uh, that in the case of the wheel configurations it is going to define how the loads are going to be transferred to the bottom uh, supporting system. Uh, more are the wheels uh, the less is going to be the stress at a certain location and that is where uh, we require a lesser thickness of the material at the bottom or uh, we can have the material which can take a lesser amount of loads. So, that is where the wheel configuration becomes important and uh, there are different types of wheel configurations which are available and it all depends upon uh, the size of an aircraft and on the basis of that size of the aircraft we can provide the various type of wheel configurations. Like here what we can see is this is a a single wheel assembly this is a one wheel on the nose and then there is a one wheel and the another wheel at the this gear thread that is be, uh, that is the main gear which are provided below the wings. Then uh, it can be uh, this is another single wheel assembly in the same case this is in the other direction then uh, we have the dual uh, wheel assembly where we are providing two wheels at a location. So, there are two wheels at the nose and two wheels at this location and two at this location and the center to center of these will be the gear thread of the main gear. Is the distance from this to this point is the wheel base. Uh, and this is obviously is provided in the case of uh, bigger aircraft where uh, we have to uh, transfer more of the loads from one location to the another location. Within the same one then uh, there is a further modification that is uh, termed as a twin tandem gear where uh, the axle which is being provided at the main gear like this is uh, made a double and that is what is a twin tandem gear. So, we have the two wheels at each of the locations, but then we have two sets being provided at the main gear location. And then there is a twin twin gear system where in this case uh, uh, we are providing the twin twin gears at the back at the wing wheels and then again uh, we are having the gears being provided in the nose area. So, in the nose as well as in the tail area we have the uh, wheels as well as at the main gear location also we have the wheels. So, these are the different configurations of the wheels uh, which can be there. Uh, now, we come to the another important characteristic that is the minimum turning radius. Uh, this minimum turning radius is uh, uh, the defined as while taking a turn the nose gear is uh, steered. Uh, as we have seen in the case of uh, uh, the road vehicles, uh, if we steer the vehicle then uh, the front uh, wheel will be steered and the back wheel is generally the powered wheel from where the power is coming to the uh, vehicle. That is the same condition is here, here the nose gear is steered while taking a turn and therefore, it makes an angle with the axis of the main gear uh, because the main gears are provided at the wing location. So, it as soon as it is uh, steering then there will be an angle with which it will be coming with respect to the axis of the main gear and this particular angle is known as angle of rotation. And the point of intersection of the axis of main gear and the line 
through axis of the steered nose gear is called the point of rotation. That is the point about up uh, with respect to which the whole of the aircraft will taking a turn. That particular point of rotation is to be identified on the basis of the extension of the axis of the main gear as well as of the steered nose gear. And wherever these two extended axes of the gears are intersecting, that particular point is termed as the point of rotation. The maximum angle of rotation varies between 50 degree and 60 degree and the line joining the center of rotation and the tip of the farthest wing of the aircraft is down as the minimum turning radius. Uh, this is the minimum value by which an aircraft can take a turn and uh, any other radius by which the aircraft will be taking a turn which will be more than this one. So, what we have to do is once we find out the point of rotation, then this point of rotation is connected is joined with the farthest point on the wing on either side and whichever is going to be the maximum then that maximum value is going to be the minimum turning radius. Uh, we will try to look at uh, this in the diagrammatic form also. Uh, here this is the plan of an aircraft and this is the nose area, this is the tail and therefore there is a, a nose gear being provided. Then this is a wing, this is another wing. So, there at this connectivity there is one um, wheel base and there is another wheel base being provided at this connectivity and that is what is the axis of the main gear. So, this is the uh, main gear. Now, uh, as this one is being turned, there is a steering of the nose gear. So, what we see is that instead of this location as in this case, it becomes a steer to this location and therefore, if we take the axis of this one, it is going in this direction. So, we have uh, this axis and if we extend this axis now in this form and we similarly extend the axis of uh, these two gears then this will be extended in this form like this and this is extended in this form like this. The location where these two axes are crossing each other that is this dotted point, this is the center of rotation means the whole of the aircraft when it is taking and steering in this direction like this will be turning with respect to this point. So, that is what is it is not uh, on the main gear itself, it is away from the main gear like this. Now, at what radius this aircraft will be taking a turn is another point. So, in that case uh, we take this particular uh, uh, point and that is the center of rotation and take the distance of the farthest tip of uh, the wing. So, if we take the farthest tip of the wing then this is the farthest tip of the wing from this side. So, if we connect this, this is one value and if we connect this one with this then this is the another value. The maximum of the two means this one is going to be the turning radius. So, it will be taking a turn with respect to this point will move like this and it will move at uh, this particular radius like this. So, that is where the turning radius is equivalent to this distance. If I join this dot with this last point that will be the turning radius. So, this is the minimum turning radius with which the aircraft will be taking a turn on any airport at while it is moving on the ground. So, that is uh, the ground turning radius which is to be provided and if the size of the aircraft is big, it means it requires a bigger turning radius. If the size of the aircraft is small, it requires a smaller turning radius. Uh, in the same form, we look at the another characteristic of an aircraft that is uh, minimum circling radius. This minimum circling radius is related to the movement of the aircraft within the air. And uh, this is the radius in space which is required for an aircraft to take a smooth turn and therefore, it is dependent on uh, three aspects like uh, what is the type of the aircraft that means, so what type of power propulsion system is available to the aircraft, what is the size of the aircraft, then what is the air traffic volume and what are the weather conditions that is going to define this minimum circling radius. Uh, and this minimum circling radius is uh, what happens in this case is that uh, and this is the 
uh, total radius which is provided at the top of the airport in which the aircraft will be circling if it is not being allowed to uh, land. So, sometimes you must have seen that the aircraft which are moving at the top of the airport that is what is the circling radius and uh, the significance of that we will be looking later. Now, in the case of the speed, there are uh, different ways the speed of an aircraft can be defined. Uh, it is like air speed, where the air speed is the speed of the aircraft in air relative to the medium and in most of the cases the medium remains air. So far we are talking about the atmospheric movements. And then within this one there is an uh, indicated speed, this indicated speed is the speed which is indicated by the instruments on the board. So, whatever instruments are telling on the board is the indicated speed and generally this is around 2 percent lower than the true speed of the aircraft. The reason is that uh, it is a relative condition and we have to look at the effect or resistance of the air and uh, the effect of that one is to reduce it by something 2 percent. Further like in this diagram what we are looking is, is that uh, uh, we have uh, the overall speed like there is a wind speed which is working in this direction that aircraft is moving in this direction. So, there is certain and this is the medium that is air and uh, the velocity of this aircraft is in this direction. So, if we are looking at in terms of a relationship between the air speed that is the speed with which this uh, aircraft is moving in the air, the speed which is termed as the ground speed that is the speed which we are looking, which we are getting by looking at this aircraft from the ground and the correlation with the wind speed that is the speed at which the wind is blowing. Then it is termed as air speed is equals to ground speed minus wind speed. So, that is how we can compute the value of the air speed or that is what is the correlation whatever two values are being given to us we can compute the third one. Uh, so, in this case the ground speed is the speed of the aircraft relative to the ground and the relationship we have already seen is that uh, air speed is ground speed plus minus wind velocity and uh, if it is Mach 1 then Mach 1 is termed as equivalent to the speed of the sound. So, that is how the speed of the aircrafts are termed uh, and generally they are being termed in terms of uh, less than one, uh, Mach value or more than Mach 1 value and uh, on the basis of that we have the subsonic and the supersonic aircrafts. Uh, that is uh, this is another uh, condition where we are looking at uh, uh, the vertical velocity condition, this vertical velocity condition is nothing but it is uh, the updraft or the lift uh, which will be caused on an aircraft because of a heavy wind which is going in the vertical direction. What has happening is that uh, this aircraft is landing and therefore, this is the flight path at which it is coming towards the runway strip and therefore, the speed of this aircraft is air speed is working in this direction. And if we resolve it into two components, then there will be an horizontal air speed component and the vertical air speed component. Okay. And uh, then in this case, if the wind is uh, wind speed is uh, there is an updraft in the upward direction, then what happens is that this vertical velocity will be equivalent to the wind speed plus vertical air speed that is the vector sum of this uh, values. Uh, that is uh, another way of defining uh, the speed in this case. Then the next characteristic is the capacity of the aircraft and this capacity of the aircraft is defined in terms of the number of passengers or the total amount of uh, freight which can be transported using that aircraft. Therefore, it is going to be governed by certain factors and the factors are obviously the size of the aircraft then the propulsive power which is available to the aircraft and the speed of the aircraft with which the things can be transported. Another characteristic is noise. Uh, this is one of the big problems in those areas where the airports are being located very near to the developed areas and the major sources of noises are engine noise, the machinery noise which is uh, more prominent at the time of landing 
and the primary jet noise which is more prominent at the time of taking off. So, these are the different components of the noise, uh, this engine noise will always remain and the disturbances are more severe during takeoff and during the landing and that is because of the jet. Since the inception of the jet engines, the noise has reduced due to technological advancement. Initially that jet noise was a very heavy noise uh, and it was a deterrent factor so as to use the jet engines in those areas where the airports are near to the developed areas. But now with the technological advancements, uh, this noise has been controlled to a lot value. Then another important aspect is the vortices which get formed at the tail and while uh, the aircraft is moving in the air at a uh, very high speed at, and this vortices have the tendency to break the tail if they are very heavy and if uh, the eddies are being formed at the back. And uh, uh, in this case what happens is that these are made of two counter rotating cylindrical masses uh, which ex uh, extend along the flight path. So, these cylindrical masses which are counteracting with respect to each other, uh, if uh, the value or the measure becomes more then they may be become uh, the hazardous condition for the tail end also. And these are formed near the tail ends of the wings as well as near the tail ends of the aircraft where there is a detachment of the movement of the air with respect to the body of the aircraft. The velocity of wind in these vortices may be very high, very, very high and uh, uh, this is how it looks like. This is the normal tent condition of the air and as the wing of the aircraft is coming in this one, then there is a distortion here where there is a higher movement at the upper side and there is a lower movement at the bottom side and then it gets transformed in this particular location and this is what is the point of separation where it goes in this direction and where it this goes in this direction. So, some separation will get caused at this location because of this type of movement and this type of movement. So, this separation is going to create a, a vortex condition at this level whether this is this direction movement and this is this direction movement and this is how this is a one photograph which has been taken uh, while this aircraft is uh, moving in the air and this is the type of uh, separation which is coming here as uh, being talked about at this level where this is going in this direction and this is going in this direction. So, that is uh, some separation will be created at this level and these are the vortices being formed at this one and this one and if the speed is so high if something is being left in this one will get turned off. Then the next aspect in the case of uh, those uh, aircrafts where the jet blast is being used this is uh, the blast that comes out of the jet engine at the rear of the aircraft and it provides the force which is required for the movement of the aircraft. So, that is required for its movement, but at, uh, if we consider it in case where the aircraft is standing and the jet blast is coming from the rear that is so hot and it uh, creates a severe condition for the things on which it will be falling. So, the severity is going to depend on two things, one is the height of the tail pipe from the round and the other is the angle of the tail pipe through which this jet blast will be coming out at the tail end. So, if it is in the upward direction then it will go up, if it is in the downward direction it will create a pro effect on the pavement on which the aircraft is standing. And therefore, there is a need to erect the blast fences which can control the damage to the building or damage to the uh, pavement. Then the next one is the fuel spillage. Fuel spillage is the fuel which get spilled over the uh, pavement uh, from the engine or from the locations where it has been filled into the aircraft and this creates an effect in terms of uh, uh, that it may cause uh, uh, the effect on the speed of the aircraft while it is moving on the runways or the taxiways or the apron areas. Now, we look at some of the influencing characteristics of the aircrafts or the effect of these characteristics on the design parameters like in the case of uh, the very first characteristic that is uh, engine type and propulsion. Uh, it is going to uh, or the size of the aircraft or uh, whatever we have discussed so far that is aircraft weight and wheel configuration, minimum turning radius, minimum circling radius, speed, capacity, noise, vortices, jet blast and fuel spillage. 
So, we will take up one by one. The engine type and propulsion this decides the size of the aircraft as we have discussed previously, the speed with which the aircraft can move obviously, the length of the runway because uh, uh, the more is the speed or more is the propulsion then the more longer runway strip is required for its movement so as to take off or so as to land and stop. Then it also increases the weight of the aircraft if the bigger propulsion system or a heavier engine is being provided. It is also uh, creating an effect to the carrying capacity of the aircraft because uh, as we have seen it is creating an effect on the size of the aircraft. We are talking here in terms of the load taking capacity. Uh, the aircraft which is provided with a bigger engine or a better propulsion system can take higher load. The noise nuisance depends on the type of the propulsion system. The circling radius if the propulsion system provides a very heavy uh, power then the circling radius will also increase that means we require a bigger area for the movement of the aircraft. But at the same time the range that is the distance up to which the aircraft can move without refueling uh, will be also bigger if the bigger engine type or a better engine type for the propulsion system has been used. Then the maintenance facilities are dependent on the type of the engine that is another type of uh, a facility which is to be checked on with respect to the type of the aircraft which are coming with the different type of engines. Blast pairs etcetera they are required in the cases where the jet propulsion has been used. Then in case of the size of the aircraft it is creating an effect in terms of the load carrying capacity. The facilities like size of apron or terminal area because whatever is the size of the aircraft say if can carry 10 passengers, 20 passengers, 100 passengers, 500 passengers or 800 passengers. On the basis of that what are the facilities which needs to be provided their size also keep on increasing. If there is a bigger size of the aircraft the bigger size of the apron is to be provided apron means the location where the aircraft is standing and similarly the terminal area size will also increase. Then if the size of the aircraft is increasing the wing span will increase and if the wing span is increasing then it will has its effect on the design of the taxiway width. The separation which is to be provided between traffic lanes, the size of the gates, the size of the gates are uh, means the locations from where the passenger will board on the aircraft that particular location is known as gate. So what should be the size of that gate? is going to be defined on the basis of the size of the aircraft. Similarly, the size of the apron where the uh, aircraft is standing, the width of the hangar gate, uh, the location where the aircraft can be parked or can be maintained. So, that is known as hangar and the size of that hangar is going to be governed by the size of the aircraft. Similarly, the length that is the widening of the taxiway on curves, uh, the size of the apron, hangars, aircraft capacity. And this is these are the effects of uh, the length and the width of the exit taxiway because how much uh, width is to be provided while it is taking a turn and that is going to be governed by the length of the aircraft. Then height is going to create an effect uh, in terms of the facilities like hangars. Tail width, tail width is uh, another uh, uh, characteristic out of the size which has its effect on the parking of the aircrafts and the size of the apron. Wheelways is uh, creating an effect on the minimum radius of the taxiway which can be provided and the gear thread is having its uh, effect on the minimum turning radius. Then the weight of the aircraft and the wheel configuration. Uh, it has its effect on the amount of thickness of the runway or taxiway or apron pavement to be provided. What should be the thickness of that pavement? The distribution of the loads through the wheels that is already we have discussed when we discussed about the configuration. Then the generation of revenue because if uh, we can take more of the load then obviously the more revenues will be generated. The turning is also governed by the aircraft weight. If it is uh, more of the weight, then the turning may be a little difficult at the sharper conditions. The stability is also governed by the uh, aircraft weight. This stability may be in terms of the support system being provided 
or it may also be in terms of the wheel configurations which needs to be provided depending on the amount of weight which an aircraft is going to carry. So, two types of stability concerns can be there. Now, the next uh, aircraft characteristic is the minimum turning radius and it has its effect on the radius of the taxiway. Uh, taxiway is the connecting uh, pavement which is provided between the runways and the apparents. The position in the landing apparents and the hangars is also going to be governed by the turning radius that how they are going to be provided within the apprentice or the hangers, the path of the nose and the main gears which will be traced on the pavement while it is taking a turn. Uh, then there is a minimum uh, turning radius, so this is how it is being defined in this case that it is a turn center at this location based on the, uh, the uh, this main gear axis which is coming in this one and this is the steering gear axis which is coming this way. So, the point of intersection is here. Now, when it is taking a turn, then if it is being provided with a dual uh, gear system at the main axis way, then they will not be following each other. So, that is the uh, thing which we have to look at that how the turning is going to happen. Then the minimum circling radius, uh, because it is related with the movement of the aircraft in the air. So, therefore, it defines basically the separation of two nearby airports because this circling radius is a very, very big uh, radius and uh, at times if it is related to a very big aircraft then it may be in kilometers. So, that is why it is, uh, defines that uh, at what particular distance the two airports can be provided with respect to each other. Then adjustment of timings of landing and takeoff aircrafts will also be dependent on the circling radius as I have told that some of the aircrafts may be having this as in kilometers. So, therefore, if it is lesser uh, then there can be a frequent landing or takeoff, but if it is bigger then uh, uh, the time difference between the landing or between the takeoff will also increase and it will have its effect on the airport capacity which is defined in terms of the number of aircrafts which it can handle in one hour. So, if this timing of landing and takeoff is increasing, it means its airport capacity will be reducing because it can handle less number of aircrafts in one hour. Then similarly, uh, it also has its effect in terms of the zoning laws which is related to the height of an obstruction being provided in the adjoining areas of uh, that airport. So, up to what particular height the constructions or the developments can be provided that is also going to be dependent on the circling radius of an aircraft. So, within this range uh, the buildings or the other construction should not go up to a height which can create a problem to the circling radius or the aircraft. Then speed obviously reduces the journey times and uh, it also helps in increasing the frequencies of operations means there can be more operations within an hour if the speeds are more. And therefore, it helps in uh, improving and broadening the air network system uh, that is are the effect of the speed. But uh, the speed is not directly creating an effect in terms of uh, on our design variables, but it has a effect in terms of uh, the cruising speed with not the cruising speed, but the speed with which the aircraft is landing at that particular speed is used for designing of facilities like taxiways or the exit taxiways that is from uh, the location from where the aircraft will be coming from runway to the taxiway. Then capacity is another characteristic uh, which uh, uh, creates an effect on the processing terminals that is what type of facilities needs to be provided. Uh, it also creates an effect on the passenger and baggage handling facilities to be provided on the airport. It all is dependent on the capacity of the aircraft to handle the passengers, how many passengers of the cargo is coming. Cargo processing time is also related with the capacity of that aircraft and the type of the equipments which are needed. Uh, is also dependent and the number of equipments which are also needed is also going to be dependent on the capacity. Then uh, the size of the apparent which is to be provided is dependent on the capacity of the aircraft because this is directly related to the size of the aircraft. The noise is 
having its effect in terms of the sleep disturbances or startle annoyances to the people or the health risk or the deafness or the heart attacks etc. to the people who are living in the adjoining areas of the airport. Uh, there can also be the effects in terms of loss of concentrations or attentiveness. Uh, these are general effects of the noises in any of the locations. Vortices at the tail ends has its effect uh, uh, on uh, the vortices and that is the wing vortices, the stresses at the joints with the fuse legs is the location where the problems will be. And the pressure on or under the wings producing the lift or the drags that is another problem associated with vortices. Finally, in the case of jet blast, this is inconvenience or discomfort or even the injury to the passengers if it is not properly located and the weak velocities of the hot exhaust gas which will be coming out at the back may harm nearby aircraft also if the parking is such. Finally, it is a fuel spillage which is seriously affecting the bituminous pavement and it may cause the slip of the wheels. Uh, so, uh, that is uh, these are the some of the uh, influencing airport characteristics, uh, aircraft characteristics which can create the effect on the facilities being provided on any of the airport. So, in today's lecture what basically we have seen is that the different type of characteristics are there of the any of the aircraft though the amount may change with respect to the size or the type of the aircraft, but the characteristics will remain the same. And finally, what we have tried is to see the effect of those characteristics on the design features or the facilities which needs to be provided on any of the airport. Uh, with which this one we will be stopping at this point and we will be meeting in the next lecture. Till then, goodbye and thank you. Thank you.